The way that Zerto is going to work in Hyper-V is remarkably similar to how it's going to work and does work today in a vSphere-based environment. And I'll touch on the reasons why that's important, but the first component is our Zerto Virtual Manager, which is just our interface for managing the replication for that site. And it's going to run all of the orchestration of the recovery and the processes behind that. And as you probably remember, it is just a Windows.NET service. You install it on a Windows VM with a static IP. And we recommend a dedicated VM for that, just because if you select to recover 800 VMs, you don't want to be fighting with your, for example, Windows vCenter for resources. And it's going to be exactly the same in Hyper-V. So you install the Zerto Virtual Manager, and you instead of linking it to your vCenter, you're going to link it to your System Center Virtual Machine Manager instead. So it's just going to ask for its IP, host name, and then a username and password with permissions to access that System Center. And once you've done that from the Zerto Virtual Manager interface, the next step is to deploy our virtual replication appliances. And exactly as it is in VMware, it's just a small custom build of Debian Linux one vCPU, three gigabytes of RAM, 12 gigabytes of disk space, and you're gonna deploy one to each Hyper-V host that you want to replicate from and to. You do that in your primary site. There's no maintenance mode. You don't have to disrupt any of the VMs running on that Hyper-V host, just as in VMware. And once you've deployed that infrastructure, you do it again in your second data center, and whether that's VMware, Hyper-V again, doesn't matter and then you link the two Zerto managers together. Once you've done that, then just as you do in VMware, you create a virtual protection group, which is our logical mapping of which virtual machines you want to replicate and protect. You specify the SLAs, the target site mappings, click go, and all the same functionality, so the continuous replication of just the changes, giving you an RPO of seconds, no snapshots. The journal-based recovery is exactly the same in Hyper-V, so you can recover to increments every few seconds up to five days in the past. And all we're going to do is automatically convert the workloads on the fly from EMDKs to VHDs and register it up in Hyper-V. And we have you know, a lot of feedback from Microsoft customers saying they don't really have a good DR solution between the Hyper-V instances. And also another common use case is we have customers saying I don't necessarily want to pay for VMware licenses for my DR site, especially if it's just sat there doing nothing. And quite often, most customers already have paid for Hyper-V in their Windows licensing, so they can install Hyper-V in DR and just leverage Zerto to get a copy of the VMs there. And it's actually a great way of building up your skill set in Hyper-V to start by using it in dev test and then DR. And then, you know, maybe in a few years, people might start really considering it for their production workloads in larger environments. And that exact route is exactly how VMware got to where they were today. And a great way of actually figuring out, you know, how will it perform, how will it, will it work with the production workloads, is once you have your VMs protected, so in vSphere here, Hyper-V here, you can do a failover test without shutting down in production, bring them online in an isolated port group on network switch, and actually have those VMs running in your Hyper-V and see you know, how does it perform, how does it actually work, as well as obviously testing the applications, checking that the data is consistent, and it actually works. And the important thing is that from these Zerto managers, it looks exactly the same. So you can't actually look at a Zerto manager and tell with the settings available, whether it's Hyper-V or VMware behind it. It just doesn't matter because it is an abstraction layer and we're just commoditizing the hypervisor that runs behind that because it's just replicating and protecting virtual machines. Any questions on that? I guess the five partners are just to show that it doesn't matter. So in the storage, exactly, yeah, because just as in VMware and in Hyper-V, because we're replicating between these appliances from anything to anything, local disk, I mean, There's no storage. specific reason why any of these are on there, right? No. Just to say any. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me, we wouldn't be putting EMC for a specific reason. <laughs> <laughs> And the, uh, just to add to that, we also, for example, we are the, today the only real replication solution for uh, vSAN, for example. 
we support vSAN. There's no other replication solution out there for vSAN. There's vSAN replication, but it's kind of like a, an SMB type uh, a solution. So for even VMware's like you know flagship vSAN, we are the only currently the only solution that really really provides full replication for vSAN. All right. This this isn't a this isn't a uh, like a conversion process. It's just a containerized replication of VM to v, VM from one so, from one area to the other, source to destination. So for the initial replication, yes, it is just a copy, but then as part of all the workflows for recovery or testing, then that's when we'll perf perform the conversion piece. So it will recre increase the recovery time objective as opposed to within the same hypervisor, but that will be included in the workflow. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing to add to your question, which is a great question, is that we don't believe in, in, in adding a hypervisor on top of hypervisors. Okay. We believe that uh, the VM, or at least the reason I'm using an infrastructure is because I want that VM to use that infrastructure capabilities. If I'm running Amazon, I want it to use the Amazon uh, uh, capabilities, whatever I'm choosing to use, or the same with Hyper-V. So we will be doing conversions as opposed to uh, uh, you know abstraction of uh, adding another hypervisor layer between the hypervisors. And I mean, I'd like to just kind of open it back to you guys in, in terms of, you know, utilizing Hyper-V as something in your DR site, as a DR target. Do you see that as feasible? Would you think you would recommend that to people if you were asked or not? That's a good point. But there's a lot of questions that might be brought up if you to have you were to have a hot VMware site with admins that are skilled and trained in that particular hypervisor in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and a cold, dormant Hyper-V site, I don't really think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, particularly during the high stress activity that's a DR failover, um, any kind of unfamiliarity is going to cause problems. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, I'd say a number of enterprise customers can typically get around the licensing around a cold site, so the advantage of using Hyper-V because you quote unquote purchased it kind of nullified in that scenario. And if you're running a warm site where it's running workloads that are non-prod that you can shut down anyways, you're already getting value from that investment. Yeah. So not questioning the technology. It makes sense what you're doing. I question the use case. Yeah. It works well for the service provider use case. Though. Yeah, service providers where I see it. Enterprise, yeah. I'm, I'm struggling. But there may well be a, a golf course certified decision to use Hyper-V in one place and, and yeah. vSphere in the other. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's a good True. point yeah. because, you know, as VMR admins, you know, in the room, we all know that, you know, it's very important as to what you're skilled up on in terms of the team. But if your CTO, CIO says you've got to use it because of X, Y, Z, then you pretty much got to use it. And also, you know, quite a lot of people might ask about it. And Gil mentioned it. Will they actually do it when they, you know, start analyzing day to day implications of it? Maybe not. But just with the fact that Zerto is allowing you to do that if you wanted sure. is the key piece. So for the, enterprise, the I see it as a good migration tool. Mm -hmm. yeah, migration, yeah, main migration. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the flexibility, I was just gonna kind of piggyback off what Chris said. The flexibility is great, but the use case, I'm just, I, I find it hard. Yeah. So I agree, the two, the two major use cases are uh, the cloud service provider going actually happy to VMware mm -hmm. and migrations. I think those will see most users first on that then we'll see if the other one will actually take place or not, but it doesn't matter. It's it's there. It's anyway. there, right. Yeah. right. Well, also what's probably slowed down the adoption of Hyper-V somewhat is not having a tool that's capable to do DR on Hyper-V. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg going on there, I think. Yeah, keep in mind that the, uh, their uh, HRM is a new product and it's, uh, and it's, uh, right. it's not there yet. And there's no, like, uh, that's the, the their, they're equivalent to SRM, so that's only new and, and uh, the Hyper-V replica was kind of like more like a visceral replication, so I think having Zerto in a Hyper-V to Hyper-V situation, we'll see a lot of that also. Just like, because I already know, uh, to my surprise, real, real customers, including airlines, etc., that are running full data centers, only Hyper-V production, everything. So for these guys, we're going to provide a new capability that they didn't have before. So exactly this concept that you have in VMware of the virtual protection group where you place the VMs in this container and will maintain the consistency so they're all recovered to the exact same point in time will also be applicable for the Hyper-V environment and it is just our logical grouping where you specify the SLAs and the mappings, absolutely no change there. But the important thing is 
is because if you've got like a 100, 200 VM environment, it's not going to be 200 applications. It might be 50 applications, and each of these consist of maybe 10, 12 VMs. And so all this protection group is saying is that you put those 12 VMs in a virtual protection group, and that application is recovered consistently to the same point in time. And it's just you know covering the back from an infrastructure point of view that you know whatever they are or are not doing in the application in terms of the interdependencies, if it's the same point in time, it's not your problem. If they're all at different points in time, then and you recover that to different points in time, then application owners can certainly come back to you and say, this XYZ is not working and I need a consistent recovery, which is why we have this virtual protection group and why it will work exactly the same in Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that this is the atomic unit also of the cloud fabric, okay? In the cloud fabric, we see ourselves taking protect, uh, visual protection groups and mobilizing them or creating a backup copy or creating an DR copy across different infrastructures. Again, and that's where people who are going to use that, you know, hey, I want to use Amazon as my DR. I want to use, uh, I have my application in Amazon. I want to use Google as my DR from Amazon, okay? All of that pieces, the virtual protection group is going to uh, keep being our atomic unit of uh, mobility, protection, and everything. <coughs> so, all the same functionality, click to fail over, boot orders, IP changes, any custom scripts will also be exactly the same. We also have the same click to test any time where you can bring the VMs online in an isolated network. Any changes made in those VMs are deleted when you stop the test. And we do this without breaking the replication or shutting down in production. And it's really you know, exactly as powerful and easy as it is. Won't matter whatever's running behind that. And then the new feature that we have already released is offsite backup. And what this essentially is Next allowing you to do one. is take copies of your replicated data to separate storage in your DR site. And we allow in an SMB share or just a local disk in the target site presented to the Zerto manager. And essentially, on your virtual protection group, you specify a policy and how frequently you want to take a backup to this location here. And it's actually just a flat file. It's a custom Zerto format that can be restored to any Zerto manager. And it's a consistent point in time across all of those VMs in that protection group. And that's an important point because you know, any traditional backup solution you use today, if there's 15 VMs in that application, then those, the backups for that might actually be 15 different points in time. Whereas with Zerto, it's the one consistent point in time taken from the journal of changes. And all it is essentially allowing you to do is extend the recoverability in the recovery site past the five-day journal that we currently have because we had a lot of customers saying, you know, Zerto is great, it's fantastic, I can go back five days. What happens if I want to go back two weeks? Then, you know, prior to this feature, we'd have to say, well, you're going to have to use something else. And all we're doing with offsite backup is saying, no, you can integrate this into Zerto. And we're running the backups from the replicated data. So you don't have to manage any backup windows in production. It's running completely off the DR site. And actually, what we're seeing in quite a few customers' accounts, especially with some huge VMs, is they're saying, I can't actually afford now to run backups in production because of the impact. And it's a 24-hour operation where I can't afford that to be running. And all it's going to allow them to do is recover the virtual machines registered into the Hyper-V or the vCenter. And it's from that point in time, whatever they want to do with that thereafter, you know, restore disks, files from within those VMs, the whole VMs themselves, it's completely up to the customer. And it is just giving them a VM or a group of VMs from that point in time. Are you able to take a VMware offsite data backup and put it into a Hyper-V to rehydrate it? Or is it same to same? Good question. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where, you know, theoretically, I definitely, it, it's, you know, it's the same as, as going uh, VMware to Hyper-V or whatever, but I don't, I'm not sure whether that workflow is going to be there at phase one. Okay. But it's definitely doable. Start a clock, 24 hours, you got to take the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I just want to mention that this doesn't come with any, uh, uh, any new price or anything. This is included in the product. You don't need to pay more. This is like 
just like an, if you upgrade to the 3.5 version, you get this. It's not, it's part of the part. All you're having to pay for is wherever it's landing, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of storage, yes. Yeah. But, but hey, many people are using it on their own sites. It's just like have some cheap storage that they use or, 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 or a data domain or whatever. What are all the storage protocols right now and storage destinations you support? SMB. Just SMB, yeah. yeah. What are the replication um, scheduling that you have? I mean, do, do you do all the way up to synchronous? So are close to synchronous? So our, our replication is near synchronous, okay. which is the nice marketing term. Right. So it's always going to be you know so 20 seconds, depending on the data change rate and when we've got a consistent point in time in the journal. So yeah, it's always going to be around 10, 20 seconds behind. Okay. Customers that go, and we have customers like that, that go between uh, the U.S. and Dubai, might get to 30 seconds, or we have uh, U.S. to uh, India, or U.S. to other places. But if you are like in uh, people that go uh, Boston to London, and we have some lots of customers that are going East Coast to London, or to Europe, they get sub-20. Okay. Any plans of supporting an object storage backend for data recovery? I know there's some some products that are able to do that so they can push it into whether it's you know, S3 or they can do it natively into OpenStack uh, block storage or uh, the object storage environments because that's kind of a new place that a lot of people are doing it. It's a great place to drop it and it's cheap yeah. in order to put it there. We can, we can argue about it's cheap or not, but yes, that's our, that's our AWS solution is going to work like that. Right. We're going to basically have an EC2 uh, VM that is going to use object storage to store all the, uh, all the DR data. Right. And when you recover, it will recover it into EC2. It initiates the EC2, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's the whole public cloud approach is going to be using that. Whether it's actually going to be cheaper or not, we can go and do the math. I'm not sure what I think it's more the, the private cloud side is more and more folks yeah, are yeah. used to just putting an object mm -hmm. storage in their destination and then. And yeah, then so we'll use that. that. We'll enable them to use that, definitely. Okay. So